I left Stargate partially because I was there in a, a one-year visiting scientist contract, mm -hmm. uh, but also because the the nature of the work felt very strange to me in that the, the whole point about uh, psychic espionage or any kind of psychic ability is that there are no secrets, that separation is an illusion. That's what these phenomena suggest. Yeah. But this is being done within a top secret context where it, every where secrets are held very tightly so at the same time you keep it like i would go into our building go to work and we were doing psychic stuff all the time the moment you leave that building not only could you not talk about it but virtually every other scientist thinks it's bullshit that this stuff just doesn't even exist so that felt very odd to me so it's so odd that after a while it just didn't feel very comfortable to be working in a place where we could have made major breakthroughs yeah and never talk about it and welcome to yet another installment of Behind Greatness by Inspire. It's Luciano here as your host speaking as usual. Um, I want to remind the listener before we get into this, um, this next conversation, which we've been looking forward to for many, many weeks. Um, I, want to, uh, I want to remind the listener to please uh, subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, rate us on whatever podcast player you use, and we are on virtually every podcast player. Um, and if you are so inclined to donate to our cause, uh, our regular listeners know that we are a charity. You can simply just go to behindgreatness.org and see uh, where where you can donate. So having said that, we're going to dive right into this. Uh, we have a special guest from Boise, Idaho today. His name is Dean Radin. Dr. Dean Radin is Chief Scientist at the Institute of Noetic Sciences, IONS. Uh, Associated Distinguished Professor at the California Institute of Integral Studies and Chairman of the biotech company Cognet, uh, Cognigenics. So, did I pronounce that correctly? Yes. Okay. Uh, he earned an, um, a master's in electrical engineering and a PhD in psychology from the University of Illinois. And in 2022 was awarded an honorary DSC Doctor of Science from the Swami Vivekananda, Vivekananda University in Bangalore, India which is an institution of higher learning accredited by the Indian government and specializing in yoga practice and research. Before joining, uh, before joining the IONS research staff in 2001, uh, Radin worked at AT&T Bell Labs, Princeton University, University of Edinburgh, uh, and SRI International. He has given over 650 talks and interviews worldwide. And he is author or co-author of some 300 scientific and popular articles, four dozen book chapters and nine books, four of which have been translated into 15 foreign languages. The Conscious Universe in 97, Entangled Minds in 06, Supernormal in 2013, and Real Magic in 2018. Welcome to the show, Dean. Thank you. Thanks for asking me. Uh, we're, it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, um, and the listener will know why. Uh, I've listened to uh, several of your interviews, more than several of your interviews uh, over the last couple of years, and we're excited here, finally getting to sit down. Two questions. Sure. Two questions. Uh, what is Real Magic, your last book? Real Magic is talking about uh, the real aspect of what stage magicians do and what is talked about uh, very broadly in science fiction and in fairy tales, and in virtually all of the esoteric traditions. So we're talking about three different kinds of practices, uh, all based on esoteric ideas. So one is called divination. Mm -hmm. The stereotype is the, the old lady looking through a crystal ball. Uh, the other is force of will, which has to do with impressing your intention to change some aspect of physical reality. And the third practice is called theurgy, which has to do with uh, the notion that there are invisible non-human spirits, or at least in, maybe once human, but no longer human, uh, that can do things on your behalf. So all three of those practices go back as far as shamanism. Uh, they have not disappeared, even in the contemporary world. There's lots of people interested in magic. There are people who call themselves witches and warlocks. Uh, and at least in one of the uh, book categories called Affirmations, uh, it's a very popular category. In addition, 
one of the ways of seeing that this is an ancient practice, but it's still vibrantly present, is to look at how magic is presented in our entertainment world. So practically every other movie is about superheroes, about magic, about psychic effects. And this is true in television shows and in novels as well. So this is this is one of those strange things that is called esoteric, meaning it's hidden, but it's kind of hidden in plain sight. That's the most interesting part of um, our existence is that uh, I believe, I've come to believe that everything is hidden in front of our faces. Yeah. So this brings me to my second question then. Uh, I learned about IONS uh, a couple of years ago when we had Mark Gober uh, on the podcast. You are a chief scientist there. What is the mission of IONS, Institute of Noetic Sciences? Well, we we have an, a, an official mission, but the one I, I like to talk about is the one that was used for many years from our founding, which goes back 50 years now. And, and it's very simple. It's exploring the frontiers of consciousness. And when you unpack that, what it means is that uh, we know very, very little about consciousness, like what it is, where it comes from. But exactly at the same time, it is the only thing that we actually know intimately. We know that we are aware. We infer that other people are aware, probably are, but we don't really know. So our, our connection to the rest of reality is through our subjective awareness. And in the contemporary science, it is assumed that this state of internal awareness comes out of brain activity. So you find books with titles like You Are Your Brain, Change mm -hmm. Your Brain, Change Your Life, all that stuff. It's all about brain. It's undeniable that there are correlations between brain activity and aspects of awareness and memory and other things that we associate with the mind. A correlation does not entail or does not suggest causation. It's a very simple statistical issue, but nevertheless, this is sort of glossed over in the neurosciences, and it is assumed that all of your internal life is due to the behavior of neurons in your brain. In fact, this became the dogma in the neurosciences because of Francis Crick, a Nobel laureate who found DNA, among other things. Uh, he, his famous phrase was, you're just a pack of neurons. And the similar phrase by Marvin Minsky, one of the pioneers in artificial intelligence is, uh, you're just a machine made of meat. So those are, those are materialistic basis of today's neuroscience and the way that many scientists think about consciousness, I would say up until about 20 to 30 years ago, and this pretty dramatically changed since then, this, this opinion within science and scholarship, that a recognition that there's two ways of thinking about consciousness. Uh, David Chalmers used this great distinction between the easy problem and the hard problem. The easy problem is, what is the correlation between what's happening in your brain and what in behavior? The hard problem is, how do we take three pounds of neural tissue inside your skull, and how does that thing become self-aware to the point where it knows that it's aware? Well, that's the hard problem because nobody has any idea how to solve that. There are a couple of things that you said to me uh, when we chatted last uh, earlier this summer, and maybe we'll go back to, to some of your story earlier, but um, just to jump a little bit, that you spent five years uh, doing experiments on psychic phenomena, and you realized that there is a there there. What does that mean? That means that uh, when you're working with controversial or anomalous phenomena, Oftentimes, it's very difficult to get a sense that you can even believe the stories that you've heard, because unless you happen to be psychic, which I'm not, I mean, in the sense of having this stuff happen all the time, mm -hmm. uh, all I knew is what I read about and what I've read that other people have done experiments. So it took about five years of doing my own experiments to see firsthand that under controlled conditions, I was getting results that are similar to what other people have reported. And since I knew what the conditions of the experiment were, I could believe in my own data. So, so people can ask me now, they do, just the other day, somebody said, you know, what, what do you do? Well, I study psychic phenomena. The immediate response was, I don't believe in any of that. Mm -hmm. Do you believe in it? And my response is, I believe in evidence. And in this case, I don't have personal evidence with it, although actually I do. But I don't, it, that's, that's not important to me. What is important is, can I get external objective evidence 
because all humans are very adept at fooling each other and ourselves. Yes, every day, so, all the time. Yeah. And so the value of, of doing experiments is that it's one step away. It's, le it's less easy to fool yourself if you do experiments and look at the data from the experiment. Uh, so I did that. And after many experiments, I convinced myself that, yeah, these phenomena are real. That's what a there there means. There's something that's actually there. So is it stretched to say that you don't believe that they are real? You know that they are real. I would say uh, I have a, I have, I'm confident that the evidence is pointing in the direction of it being real. So I know that that's a bunch of weasel words in it. There's a lot of caution in there. This is something you just learn from a being a scientist. <laughs> yeah. So people say, well, do you, have you proven this? And my response is the only place that we find proof is in alcohol and in logic. <laughs> yes. That's where we find proof. You do not find proof in science. Vino when, once you take a scientific concept and turn it into a practical application, hmm. it works reliably. You can say, well, okay, that's kind of like proof. But otherwise, no, we deal with evidence. So then do you believe slash know that all of us have the capabilities uh, to be psychic? I don't know that. I would say uh, the evidence points in that direction, but it points in the very similar way to us having the ability like we all have some sports or musical talent ability. Right. So if you look at the the, the normal curve, some people on the right side of that curve will just be stars at what they do. Mm -hmm. People on the left side of the curve will be ones who can't carry a tune. Uh, they have never had a psychic experience. But, but thinking just of humanity as a whole, it's roughly like a normal curve. And so most people will have a little to a lot of this kind of ability. I'm open to believing that all of us, even on the... Uh on the downside of that curve, uh, the block side of that curve, that those blockages can be taken away, or they can be unblocked to show that the veil is actually very thin. But that, that gets me thinking to another question I had for you. Uh, and I want to go back to a little bit of your personal background, because it got me interested to understand a little bit about how uh, you worked. Your parents were um, a very artistic, so you grew up in an artistic family. You were musically inclined. Can I say that? I say yeah. inclined. Sure. Um, and you spent uh, tw 20 years playing the violin. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what you were going to become. So a violinist. Right. Uh, and you said, and this is, I guess the question comes into this, right? So you tell me if I'm, if I'm misstepping here. You said after years of playing, uh, I guess now you were in your 20s, uh, the mechanics of playing became automatic it became so automatic, it became boring, and that you would have two hours of repertoire already in your head, um, but your conscious mind wasn't involved anymore. And oh. this is some, something you admitted to me. This, I, this fasc it was fascinating for me personally, so maybe it's boring for you. But you said a, a professional musician would take that time uh, and make something out of it, but you never learned how to do this. That uh, as a concert violinist, you would want to create your own style, but you didn't. You were very good. You weren't passionate about it, uh, but you didn't use your conscious mind in it. I would say that a successful concert violinist, meaning a soloist or somebody who is the, the, a person playing with an orchestra as a soloist, uh, the mechanics of it, the kinesthetics of playing, you, a talented person will get within a few years. You really, you don't have to think about what you're doing anymore in terms of, of the complexity of, of the movements. The thing that separates someone like myself, who is technically very good, I could play back almost anything, versus somebody who you want to listen to, is that you can, you can engage the emotions of the music because that's, that's what pulls people. It's, it's the emotional aspect of it. And if you think about the range of emotions that uh, people can display, some people are very emotional, meaning that they have, they, they, they're not exactly, um, they're not flopping all over the place. They're not manic depressive, but you can have a very broad range of emotion and you can express it. So a musician that you want to listen to is expressive in the music. My range of emotion is pretty thin. It's, it's, it, it does not flop all over the place. 
I'm usually very calm, like I'm in this middle range. That makes it difficult then for me to be highly expressive as a musician because the range isn't very good. So you would hear what you would hear is technically precise music, but not necessarily emotional. And without that quality, then that that's somebody who's not going to end up being a very good concert violinist. So let's take that. Let's take that that um, that block of conversation just now in the last two minutes, and shift it over to the conversation on psychic abilities. But I, I brought this up in a podcast because I was inspired within the conversation. And we thought, and I, uh, I mentioned emotions because it came up. Wouldn't so using 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 this argument, would it not make sense that emotions um, and emoting and the ability to emote to be close to your emotions and experiencing a wide array of emotions that you can experience, wouldn't the closeness to the emotions be the key or be a strong key to accessing psychic abilities for some people yes but not for everyone we're talking about idiosyncratic talents i say this because some of the people i know like from from the government espionage psychic espionage program these are military guys uh the last person in the world that you figure would be the stereotype of this highly emotional typically female psychic, but they were exceptionally good at one particular kind of psychic ability. So I would say that this is really is more about idiosyncratic ways the talent can express itself uh, rather than simply being, it's a matter of your amygdala, it's in the brain, you know, the, the, the juiciness of your emotional stretch. For some people, that's very important. I do know, I have friends who have a combination of very broad range in emotionality, and no censorship, which is another aspect. So if you if if you don't self censor, you're you like have a closer contact to the world itself. Like your senses like go right through you, and you're there. And also with a high emotion uh, uh, range. So those are the people I think fit the stereotype better. Like they they're like walking psychics all the time. That's very different though. And somebody who has a different kind of talent where it's it's more, you can almost put it like it's more crystalline, it's analytical, but it's still psychic. That's funny you say that just as a quick digression, uh, maybe a point of interest for the uh, for the listener. We had um, uh, we had a fellow from Milan on the podcast uh, somewhere in the 90s, episode 90 something. Uh, his name is Eduardo. And he talked about his mother and how his mother had, uh, he used the word crazy very lightly and very lovingly. But he said she had no filter and she was too fast for the world. He was saddened by it because she was she had psychic tendencies, but she uh, she was out of control, uh, mm -hmm. using his words. So you mentioned the military. Um, let's get into something else as well, because we had Russell Targ on the podcast, mm -hmm. uh, as you know. And Russell Targ is now close to 90 years old. Um, yeah. He was uh, also a scientist like yourself. Uh, physicist, and uh, just for the listener here, just to have him catch up for uh, five seconds here, uh, he was hired eventually by NASA and then by the CIA to run a program where he um, he was asked to research uh, psychic abilities and also train high-level military personnel uh, and government personnel in these abilities for about a decade, starting in the early 70s. Yeah. Um, I think it was a little after he left, you were asked to come on to this program. That's right. I, tell us a little bit about it, please. Well, I had gone to a conference and talked about some of the research I was doing at the time. I was at Bell Labs and I was doing some psychic experiments. So I went to that conference, I presented the results. And at the time there were rumors that the US government was involved in psychic espionage. Uh, it was known that some research of this type was going on at SRI International because they, they had published a few papers. They didn't talk about the military stuff, but they did talk about what they were doing. So I knew who they were, um, and we got to talking, and they invited me to join the program. So that, that's the sort of offer that you can't refuse. Of course. So you join the program, uh, and so remote viewing for, again, the listener who didn't listen to that particular episode, remote viewing is the practice of stilling your mind 
and seeing uh, seeing things and people and locations anywhere uh, uh, across the um, space time spectrum. Right. It is a modern euphemism of what used to be called clairvoyance. It's exactly the same. Okay. Uh, there are other modern euphemisms, and later in the in the government program, it was called anomalous cognition, and and these euphemisms are useful in that uh, when you use the sensitive P words, as I say, the psychic, the psi, the, all of those kinds of P words, uh, people oftentimes think they know what you're talking about. They think, you know, they hear it and they're thinking, oh, it's like Madame Zodiac or something. And so the new terms are developed to either make the description more neutral, like anomalous cognition, or to, to use a term like I, I coined this term of presentiment, which means pre-feeling. So it's a form of precognition, but it's you're not cognizing anything. Your body is reacting to something in, a, in an emotional way or nervous system way. Mm -hmm. So it's presentiment. So we make up these terms to describe what we're dealing with without also implying that the, those terms are explanatory. They're not. They're descriptive. This, by the way, is true for all of the psychic terms, like telepathy. People think, oh, I know what that is. Well, not really. It's a description of the nature of the experience, but it's not an explanation for it. Why did you leave Stargate? I left Stargate partially because I was there in a, a one-year visiting scientist contract, mm -hmm. uh, but also because the, the nature of the work felt very strange to me in that the, the whole point about uh, psychic espionage or any kind of psychic ability is that there are no secrets, that separation is an illusion. That's what these phenomena suggest. Yeah. But this is being done within a top secret context. Where, it, every, where secrets are held very tightly. So at the same time, you keep it, like I would go into our building, go to work, and we were doing psychic stuff all the time. The moment you leave that building, not only could you not talk about it, but virtually every other scientist thinks it's bullshit, that this stuff just doesn't even exist. So that felt very odd to me. So it's so odd that after a while, it just didn't feel very comfortable to be working in a place where we could have made major breakthroughs yeah. and never talk about it. Yeah, that's that's the that's the tragedy I see with that program uh, with any other like programs is that the, the, there's so much great science that can come out of this, but because it has such a narrow focus on military operation, it can go nowhere. And of course, it's um, it's to the benefit of uh, the mil military organization for it to be poo pooed in public, right? To help yeah, them with the this value system. of any. Uh, it, I, I hesitate to use the word weapon, but the, uh, say technique. The value of a technique goes up if other people think that doesn't exist. Yeah. And this, by the way, is one of the reasons why there are a lot of conspiracy theories about UFOs, right? The government spends a lot of time and effort for many, many decades saying this stuff is nonsense. Yeah. Well, and you think on the inside, well, may, why may are they telling us? It because they have some in the back room and we have anti-gravity and we have, well, I don't have any answers to that. But having seen what goes on, or what used to go on, at least for the psychic side, you know, it makes you wonder. Everybody understands what a book ban is. So anytime anybody tells me that book is banned, you can't read it. The first thing in my head is, why is it that you don't want me to read it? And I'm going yeah. to read it. Yeah, all of my books should be banned, by the way. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Exactly. yeah, absolutely. Do not read these books. If, if Yeah, they're banned. Yeah, it, it would be great for, uh, it'd be great for sell through. Yeah, in fact, uh, yeah, that's a good title for a book. This book is banned. This book is banned. Yeah, oh, that's, I like it. I like it. Can I have rights to that too? Because yeah, you know, sure. we kind of created yeah. that together. And sorry, last last note on Stargate, because <clears throat> you said something very interesting to me too that uh, Russell Tark, in the long conversation that we had with him, uh, didn't. Um, you said that sometimes they would have people, so government officials, military officials, stay for a few days after their experience. Yeah, uh, because they were spooked. Is that right? Well, because Russell was involved in these sort of things, a contract monitor would come, would want to see remote viewing happen, with, usually with the assumption that they would watch some talented person do this, right? So they can go back and report to their, their bosses that, yeah, that's, that's a real thing. And uh, Russell has told a number of stories where rather than getting somebody else to be the psychic, they would have the contract monitor be the psychic. 
uh, for a number of, even for strategic reasons. For, first of all, Russell is a master at getting anybody to be psychic for a short period of time. We don't mm. know how that is. It's magic. He would be the interviewer. The contract monitor would be the viewer. And then these were typically in the context where there's some other person going somewhere. And the, the, the task of the viewer is to describe where they are. It's called mm. an outbounder experiment. So they would do that experiment. The contract monitor would would provide some kind of imagery, and it turns out it was a good match. Well, if the contract monitor came in as a, as a skeptic, but with a capital S, meaning this stuff is bullshit, this cannot happen, and yet they, through their own experience, show that it does happen, <laughs> you don't want to immediately let that person go back to work because they'll seem like a raving lunatic. Because people will know what they were like before, and now they're coming back. They'll say, "Well, they've slipped you some drugs or something." I mean, that's ridiculous. Yeah. So, so, so what you do then is you take that person, you allow them to calm down, you allow them to take the part of their belief system has been cracked, and you allow it to reassemble itself, like put it all back down with one new element. The new element is, yeah, there's some strange things like this that work. We don't exactly know how it works, but it's yeah, it's real. It's no big deal. <laughs> no big deal. Yeah, it is the deal. It is the deal. Well, it it is, and at the same time, it's no big deal in the sense that it's been around since probably forever, right? We're not creating something out of nothing. It's a phenomenon that's been around since humanity has been around, and we know it exists in some animals too. So, well, all we're doing then is it is simply changing the lenses on our view of reality and saying, oh, well, we we missed a few things. Which, I mean, we, no one should be surprised at that. Before we had microscopes and telescopes, you know, the, the world was what you see. Well, we know that the world is much more complex than that. And this is just one other aspect of it that we were only beginning to understand. Well, yeah, you, I mean, you, you did tell me as well, I wrote it down. Science is good at studying the world from the outside, but not from the inside. And yeah. that is what you're it, attempting to do. Yeah, you study from the inside through the contemplative traditions, mm -hmm. which so far... Is is fledgling at best within the scientific tradition. Well, I, obviously, you, you and your team are um, are moving that needle, uh, which is also why we wanted to have you on. And yeah. so, speaking of moving moving that needle personally, uh, I wanted to bring up. Uh, a, I wanted to prompt you on a story that you related to me. But before that, you said that at four or five years old. So you you were uh, you were born you were born in the Bronx. Your family um, then moved down to the south. Is that right? Atlanta, yes. Yeah, to Atlanta, uh, and then you moved back up to the north, where you had at six years old. You had to, uh, you had to change. Or you had to mask your southern accent. Yeah, yeah, I had to lose the accent pretty quick. Yeah, and you said at age four or five, you had existential angst. I don't yeah. think I followed up on that. What is? What do you mean by that? It was probably probably a little bit older, probably around six five or six. One of my friends describes it as I was I was born with an extra Y chromosome. I was constantly asking why about everything. <laughs> so it's like it's, it's built into my DNA somehow that uh, there's like a philosophical bent that some kids have. Uh, and so I was always wondering, even as a very young child, like, why am I here? Why is anything here? Which are philosophical issues that <laughs> normally you wouldn't think that kids would be having these existential issues, mm -hmm. uh, but it really is. It's about existentialism. I didn't know that that was even a word at the time, but that is it. When you start wondering uh, about uh, what is it inside of me that makes me aware of who I am? The other thing is maybe having those kinds of thoughts. I remember very clearly, this was in the third grade, uh, where kids were behaving badly. Usually the boys were behaving badly and they'd, they'd get out of control and I remember very clearly thinking one day, what's wrong with these kids? Well, I was exactly the same age, <laughs> but I, maybe it was empathy with the teacher or something. You know, you you you've get that that uh, that pa very famous painting by Edward Munch of mm -hmm. the scream. Yep. But that's what the, that's what the teacher was doing basically. She wasn't she wasn't making it explicit, but I can see inside her head she's having, oh my god, this is not good. And I, so I remember thinking, what, what's wrong with these kids? Well, that actually has never gone away because I've, I've never enjoyed being a kid. I don't like kids generally because they're like uncontrolled monkeys. <laughs> so I have no idea where all of this comes from because I was a kid. Uh, but anyway, that's 
I don't know. That's that's what that is. Well, maybe you're having an out-of-body experience for a long period of time. To... <laughs> yeah, or I'm reincarnated a million times. And so I'm tired of being a kid again. So you, you had a story, an awakening when you were a young adult. Uh, and I've heard you relay this story to somebody else as well. But I, I think it's it's worth it's worth repeating if you're okay with it. Um, the chapel story? Oh, yeah. So at the University of Massachusetts, where I went as an undergraduate, uh, the chapel, which is more or less in the center of the university, was an old building, but that's where the orchestra would play. And I, at the time, I was the concertmaster of the orchestra, so it had certain meaning to me. And then one day I was walking to class, and it was in February. It was on my birthday, February 29th. I was born on a leap day. And I tend to remember those days more than other days, the other birthdays, because the other birthdays don't exist. Sure. Uh, so I, I try to remember something about those days when they happen. And people are always saying, well, what do you do if there's, if there's no February 29th and some other day? Well, there's no birthday. So, you know, I, I save them up until there is a real birthday. So that morning I'm walking past, it's, uh, it's very cold. It's gray, like a gray fog. You couldn't see anybody else. It's very quiet because it's early in the morning. I'm walking past the chapel. And I remember thinking to myself, I, I need to pay attention to this because this will be, this is like the memory of this day because the rest of it, who knows what's going to happen. And at that moment, I woke up. And what I mean by that is that uh, my, my sense of awareness felt as though everything up to that point, because I was 20 years old at that point, was like a dream. Like I was waking up from a dream. And like when you wake up from a dream, some elements of it are still kind of fresh, but a lot of it begins to fade away pretty quickly. And so it was that fading away quality that is what I felt. I felt like, oh, I've, I have been dreaming for 20 years and now I'm awake. So th that, that was such a startling experience. I remember it very clearly. I remember what it felt like and all the rest. I remember uh, where I was in relationship to the chapel and what the rest of the place looked like and what the temperature, all of it is in there somehow. And Similar things have happened, not anywhere near as dramatic since then, where I, I felt like, oh, I'm awake now. And well, well, what was I doing before? Which is interesting and sort of annoying at the same time, because I think I'm awake now. But having those had those experiences, I'm thinking, well, maybe not as quite as awake as I think I am, because I woke up at least three times before. So it it raises interesting questions about well, again, like going back to when I was four or five years old, what exactly am I again? Mm -hmm. uh, am I my thoughts? Is this brain stuff happening? So it's all those same curious questions that have haunted me, so to speak, for a long time. Do you believe that that's what uh, your life will be once you once your body dies? Your life will be a dream? Forgotten? Um, it, it's possible. I, I really don't have any idea what's going to happen. I've heard a lot of stories, of course. Sure. Um, if I had to guess, I would guess that uh, that conscious awareness will remain for a short period of time, but then it will dissolve in the same way that a drop of water will dissolve into the ocean. So we have we're we're always in an ocean of consciousness. Uh, our separateness comes about because of of the crest of a wave. We're momentarily a crest of the wave. We feel separate. We're not really separate. And so when the body goes away, it's like the wave calming back down and going back into the ocean. So if personality and memory stayed, well, then you, I'd feel something like myself now, I suppose, but I wouldn't have a body. So I don't know what that would be like, but I kind of suspect that the memory and personality and all the rest of it, that's, that slowly fades away too. Yeah. That's what perplexes me more than, and well, actually that's not true and not more than anything, because there's a lot of things that perplex me, um, is the personality. Why the heck we all have different personalities. Well, memory. So memory and genetics, that, that's your personality. Memory and genetics. Yeah. Your, your genetic predisposition uh, shapes to a very large extent how you experience the world. So I'm talking a combination of how you're, feel, you know, how you're built physically, how your physiology works, how your memory works. Uh, all of that is an important element of how your personality develops. And the memory then is you will have certain experiences over the course of your life that shape your memory. So it's memory and genetics together. That's 
who you are. Hmm. Well, genetics, again, I'm, I'm dumbing this down because it's the only <laughs> it's the only level I can play at here. But with genetics, we're 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 speaking we're speaking to our our family trees. And so I have three siblings. All the four of us all have different personalities, but we all come from the same parents. Yeah. So there will be similar genetics, but not the same. Mm. And similar experiences, but not the same. Mm. You changed a bit with me. Um, we had the, the, the last conversation we had. Uh, your demeanor changed when we started to talk about the violin. And then it changed again when we talked about bluegrass and the banjo. You left a, a possible career in music but the music didn't leave you. Yeah. Um, so I looked up bluegrass. I, I you know, I've, I've heard of bluegrass. I never follow bluegrass. So I looked it up in preparation. I, <laughs> in preparation for this interview, I, uh, I played, uh, uh, I played songs from the dead South. Have you heard of this band? No. Yeah. They're from the South. Um, and there are four guys, they all play a string instrument and one of them is banjo. Banjo mm -hmm. is actually the, the, the one that's loud and clear. Mm -hmm. uh, so it got me into the mood, <laughs> I guess, uh, to have this conversation, but it is, so the banjo is a very different instrument, um, sonically speaking than the violin. Yeah. Why? Well, it's fretted for one thing and it's steel strings and it's five strings with a droner, a droning string. Okay. So you you have a, a sound which is very unlike the violin, where you also you can make a kind of droning sound, but it's uh, it's like any plucked instrument. It's and it has a resonator on it too, so it really projects. Um, the violin could have a continual kind of analog sound to it, whereas the banjo is almost digital. I mean, it's not really, but it's that way because of the way that you're plucking at it. It makes digital sharp sounds. But the, the bluegrass in particular, there's lots of ways of playing a banjo. Uh, I think, I, I don't know why I just found it so fascinating, but maybe it's because I grew up in Atlanta and it was on the radio or something and sort of mm -hmm. went into my head. The music is generally extremely happy. It's, it's a fast, fast paced. I love the harmonies. The banjo part of it is great. I've also played the mandolin. I can play the fiddle. The words generally are very, very sad. So there's, I mean, this part of the blue part of it. It's like the blues, but it's using music which you can trace back into Ireland and a few play, uh, places like that. It's like Celtic music. Uh, so I don't, I don't exactly know why I fell in love with it. But the thing I learned very quickly was when I in graduate school when I decided I, I can't continue on this path as a violinist. I went to a live performance of a bluegrass band, and it was just so thrilling to hear that. I decided, okay, I'm going to learn how to play the banjo. Well, I, I was practically at a professional level within a month. And, and I learned that, that because of what you have to learn kinesthetically with the violin, it transferred almost immediately. Like the left hand and the violin is all about articulation of the fingers. On the banjo, it's mostly about articulation on the right hand where you're doing the picking because they're complicated right. roles and stuff. The left hand fingerboard is almost exactly the same as a violin. So that's why I was able to pick it up very fast. And of course, then just for fun, I also played in bands, but for fun, uh, you, you could play the banjo. It's yeah. I mean, it is also much, much, much easier than the violin. It's a, it's a, even the way you describe it. And for anybody who's ever listened to banjo, it's a, uh, it's a more playful experience. Yeah. Yeah. It's fun to play. It's fun to listen to. So you were, it sounded like, or sounds like you were more passionate about playing the banjo uh, while you were in it than the violin. Is that right? Because, because it was more fun hmm. and because the violin at that point was becoming work. Yes. Right. You're playing yes. one to four hours a day and you're getting paid sometimes to do that. You know, it's like any performer, maybe I don't feel so good today. Too bad. You're on. You know, I have great sympathy for people in the performing arts who end up taking drugs to, to push them up or to pull them down. Mm -hmm. uh, because otherwise, you know, you can't tell somebody, I don't think I want to do this today. Well, so there's a new thing happening, which I've never seen before in sports. I don't know yet about music, but even in music, where young people will say, you know what, I need a mental health day. I can't do this now because they recognize that the only way you can push it is to start taking drugs. And that's not good for anybody. So I wish we'd 
had thought about that back then. You just say, you know what? I don't think I want to play today. But, you know, if you have an entire orchestra, yeah. well, if half of the people say, I don't feel good today, well, you know, then what? What do you do? We are generally the same generation. Uh, and I remember growing up, sports and anything else, it's the 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 philosophy mantra is suck it up. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Suck it up. Yeah, if you need to take an amphetamine or something to do it, go do it. Well, yeah. that's I don't that's care about your starting out a bad road. Of course. So yeah. there's a, a, a last question. And so did you did you feel more emotionally charged after playing a banjo? Do you emote more? Um, well, the curious thing about banjo in particular and bluegrass in general is if you look at a banjo player in a typical band, it's as though they're a Vulcan. From Star Trek. <laughs> there is no emotion expressed at all. The music is going like crazy. Oh, they're right? concentrating. You're, yeah. You're, well, it's not even that. After a while, you learn how to do that. And you don't have to think about it anymore. But it, it's something about the, it's almost a stoic way of presenting how you're playing. And it's and mainly in the banjo. You, you would see this on the other instruments as well, and certainly not on the singer. But it's, there's a certain stoicism that appealed to me about it. You're playing this amazingly fast, delightful music. But you're just like there. And I don't know what about that appealed to me, but maybe it's because I didn't want to be highly emotive. But yeah. you can kind of through through the sound of the through, banjo itself. Through the instrument. Yeah, yeah, yeah. through the instrument. Yeah. And and because and it's because it was so much easier to play than the violin, I mean just technically easier. Uh the other aspect of the the reason why the difference is important to me is because it gets really tiring after a while. You're playing an instrument that you're holding up and doing things for a couple of hours, you just get tired. Well, I, some people will start exercising and afterwards they say, wow, they feel great. They feel energized. I feel completely the opposite. I do exercise for 20 minutes. I feel exhausted. <laughs> and so that is not the kind of person you want to be if you want to be a professional musician. Whereas I like the idea of you're being quite stable and stoic and your fingers are going a mile a minute and that you don't feel exhausted after a while. So th that is an example, by the way, of how genetics play a role because the genetics built my body the way it is. I'm not an athlete. I, I can't, I, I, don't get in, I, I don't get inspired or excited by doing exercise. I avoid it if I can. Yeah, but you also did say being a professional musician was like being an athlete because it was yes, so exhausting. Yeah, it yeah. is, yes. Not so much as a banjo player. I mean, just, just the fact that you're holding, the instrument is being held over a strap. So sure. you're not spending a lot of muscular effort. You're doing muscular effort in your fingers. Yeah, your back just holds it. Yeah. So check out the Dead South when you can. Let me know what you okay. think. Uh, maybe right. maybe, it, maybe it's a, a, a full Southern band. I don't know. But a, a friend of mine, actually, a, a close friend of mine who is one of the co-founders to this podcast. Oh. Let me oh. know. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, why do you want to write a memoir? Why do I want to write a memoir? Huh. Did I say I wanted to write a memoir? Yeah. Oh. Um, I don't know. I guess uh, I guess I have some stories that some people find interesting. And one of the reasons I write books in general, and even articles, is to get it out of my head. Right? So somebody will say, oh, tell me all about psychic phenomena. And I'll just say, here's this book. I wrote this so I don't have to remember all that stuff. I'm, on, I'm more interested in the future than the past. The books are, are really a way to offload information that otherwise is rattling around inside my head. Mm -hmm. and so it's a way to offload it. And the same would probably be true of a memoir. But as I said, I'm always more interested in the future than the past. The memoirs are all about the past. Do you mind if I ask you one more thing about the past? Sure. Uh, you had uh, a Thunderbird story. Yeah. Uh, we went to Expo 67 in, I think it was Montreal. Montreal, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we went to Expo 67. We drove there from Massachusetts. You go all the way through Maine. You go up to Montreal. Uh, so we went there, had a fine time. And then coming back, uh, my parents are in the front. Uh, my brother's on the left side in the back. I'm on the right side. And there's miles and miles of nothing, basically. You're going through Maine and seeing forest after forest. Well, there was one spot in the middle of the highway. No, no other cars were around. And we're driving through the forest. And I'm just sort of absentmindedly looking out. And I see what looks like a bird sitting on the railing on the right side, way ahead of us. And as we got closer to it, I noticed the bird kept getting bigger and bigger. It was a big bird, like a 
really big bird, like a six foot tall bird. And as it got close, like maybe five or six car lengths away, I noticed that the bird turned and looked at me. I mean, I felt like it was it was looking at me from that distance. And so I was I was now watching it very closely. And as we went past, uh, the bird turned its head appropriately as though it really was looking at me and then went away. And I immediately asked my brother and my parents, did you see that thing? I mean, this this was like literally a six foot bird sitting on, on the edge of the railing. They didn't see anything. And it stuck with me, that, that experience. So afterwards, I started looking up giant eagle birds, because they sort of look like an eagle, uh, in the middle of Maine. And very quickly ended up with the Thunderbird myth, the, the Indian idea of something that looks like a bird. It's not really a bird, but it, that's the way that it would present itself to you, which is a harbinger of, of good or bad. Generally, it, it's a it's like a uh, an aspect of transformation. It's a transformative experience that gives you a clue about something important. And what do you, what do you think he was telling you? I don't know what it was telling me. Maybe he was saying, uh, you know, you should stop the violin and start playing the banjo. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't know. But it, it's the kind of experience that stuck with me because it's one of similar experiences where something very strange happens, like or at least out of the ordinary happens, very clear in my mind that others did not experience at the same time. So you know, is it a hallucinogenic thing or probably not because I was like 10 or 12 years old at the time. Um, so I don't know what those things are, but it gives me much greater sympathy when I hear people telling me strange stories about apparitions, about UFOs and all that stuff. The, the world is very, very strange. We, we are we're constantly being pushed to constrain it into a kind of an orthodoxy, something that's comfortable and, and the consensus can agree upon. But I think the range of, the, of actual experiences and the nature of the actual world is much, much, much more complex and interesting at the same time. So I, I agree. I agree. And when we talked about your intuitive voice, your intuitive voice, you said you know it to be true, but you don't know why it is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's like the definition of a noetic experience. You know, absolutely that is correct. You will later get verification that it's correct. You have no idea where it came from. The institute for which you head as a chief scientist was founded yeah. by, in 1973, by an astronaut who had such that's an right. experience. Edgar Mitchell on the way back from the moon to the earth on Apollo 14 had a full-blown mystical experience uh, where he felt like it was one with everything, the entire universe, which is a very classical mystical experience. And so when he came back to earth, he, he, he like anybody, I suppose, would wonder, what is that? And coming from a scientific background, he started our institute as a way of using the best tools of science that we currently have to understand or better understand or at least investigate what is that? And what does that say about the nature of reality? I didn't think I would share this, but uh, you prompted me to when you said it was, uh, when, you, when you mentioned, um, when you described his mystical experience. I had a mystical experience uh, two weeks ago. I told you I was traveling in Italy. Yeah. Um, and I went to a city called Matera, which is in Southern Italy, kind of the arch of the boot. Mm -hmm. And uh, Matera was... Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, part of the intro, the first couple of scenes of the last James Bond movie. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, walking down, uh, walking down to the old center, um, uh, facing the city as I was walking towards it, and then finally finding myself in the middle of it, I had a mystical experience. It was, it felt like I, I shouldn't have been there, that this is a place that was so ancient um, that didn't care about me. It tolerated mm. my presence, but it really didn't want me there. Um, and that's what really attracted me to stay there. <laughs> so I stayed there for a few hours. But I cannot, I cannot explain it past those words. It was, um, it really filled me with all sorts of wonder. Mm. Uh, it, it is a cultural capital of Europe now. I think it's in the last few years now it's been named as a cultural capital of Europe. Is there, there have been inhabited, excuse me, there are inhabited domiciles there that are over 9,000 years old. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a mystical place. Anyway, thought yeah. I'd share that. Uh, well, so I'll just add one thing to that. Yeah. that th there is a, a concept of place memory 
that some places feel dramatically different. So I had an experience like that when I lived in in uh, Edinburgh, Scotland. They, they have the the old castle there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The castle, uh, it's a tourist place now, but the, one of the rooms in the castle is a memorial to all of the Scottish soldiers who have died in wars for, for centuries. So I was, when I was moving like anybody else in, in the uh, a, a self-guided uh, tour of, of the castle. And I got to that room and I felt so sad. Like this wasn't me being sad because I was looking at things on the wall. But it's as though the room had absorbed the sadness of, of people for centuries in that one spot. The granite held it or something. I had to get out of that room fast because I, I just walking into it, it felt like a curtain had fallen down of just such sadness of it all that it it really dramatically different from like stepping into the space versus stepping away from the space. Thank you for sharing that. It's um, that's part of the excitement of uh, being alive, knowing that it's you are more than just who you see. <laughs> yeah, yeah wow. things happen out there. Last question, Dean, uh, and I appreciate your time. It's uh, it's, it's been wonderful. Um, what is greatness to you? Greatness is something that uh, lasts for a while. Uh, and that people can look back on and decide that it was great, right? So the history decides what's great and what lasts. Uh, one hopes that it is beneficial, but there are some things that have happened that last that are not so beneficial. So are they great? Well, I'm not sure I would use that word to describe it, but anything that lasts for a long time and influences the future is kind of great. It influences evolution of people. As I said, I prefer to, I mean, it's it's very unfortunate that the way the history is taught and remembered is mostly through war. Well, that's that's no good. What about all of the equally wonderful things that were happening? So that when you think about, well, what was it? Well, it's Beethoven and it's it's uh, Da Vinci. And, you know, we come up with like 10 things. Really? And, and endless wars and Da Vinci? And, and Da Vinci, of course, is involved in creating war, rules of war. So. Yeah. So what is great things that last and hopefully with a positive spin? Well, it looks like the work that you and your team are doing are moving in that direction to last. Uh, And hopefully more people know about it. We hope so. Dean, uh, again, thank you. Thank you for this discussion. Uh, It's well worth the wait. My pleasure. Hey, it's Enrico Colantoni here, actor, director and dedicated napper. Like what you heard today, there's more to come. Make sure to subscribe to Behind Greatness and learn about our live events at inspirenorth.com. You'll also find links to our social media right on our website, so be sure to give us a like and follow. Until next time, stay inspired.